though he left. And so the uh, scrolls of Herculaneum, uh, which I guess were affected by the Vesuvius eruption, and what they could do about it. Um, I showed that to my friend of mine a few days ago, and he said, 
well, I don't really get what else there is left to do. That obviously works. So now I'm going to tell you what's left. Um, on the left here is a slice from what we just saw, which is the Getty Scroll, which is written on parchment. It's only about five wraps around. And it also is written with an ink that is either iron gall ink or something like it. And what that means is that in x-ray, it shows up really brightly. So actually, on the scroll on the left, which if the scale were shown more correctly, is quite a lot smaller than this one on the right, uh, we can see these bright spots here. And these actually indicate the presence of ink. So just looking at one slice like this, you're seeing sort of a cross-section like the rings of a tree. Just seeing the ink in this view doesn't really show anything. That's why the entire process the video just illustrated is necessary to actually see the text. But at least you're starting with something, like you can actually see where the ink is. Um, additionally, since there's only five or so layers and they're a little more separated, this is actually tractable to segment out and identify the layers. Now, this is what we're trying to work on, and this is a section of Herculaneum scroll. And we have two big problems. One of them is obviously the segmentation is more challenging. This is hundreds of layers, they're much more closely packed together. Um, trying to sort of disentangle that and fly that is much more challenging. And then secondly, even if you were to do that correctly, there's no ink that shows up brightly. So these are written with carbon ink on what is now carbonized papyrus, and when you put it in x-ray, they look the same. Um, so that's the problem I'm talking about today and how we're addressing that. So I'm calling it the carbon ink problem. Um, and as we kind of looked at with the Getty example, but this is a more illustrative example, this is a totally separate manuscript. Uh, this had some burn damage, but it's written, the ink is iron gall. Okay, so when it's put in CT, this is just a volume rendering of that. And you can see, even without doing any segmentation or flattening, you can already see words and letters sort of pop out. This ink is this bright, dense region. We'll see. Now, we're not working with anything like that. These are some of the open fragments of the Herculean collection. You can see there is, in fact, ink, and actually, visually, uh, if it's exposed, you can see it. So it's not that the ink is uh, totally invisible. It's a little bit hard to see, and to benefit that, sometimes we'll image those in infrared or something, but at least it's there. I mean, you can at least tell there's going to be characters there. Um, in X-ray, on the other hand, it's pretty much invisible, or at least that was the conventional wisdom. And so this is a really small fragment. This entire fragment is about two millimeters wide. It only shows one character. Uh, but when we basically put it through the entire pipeline illustrated in the video, the image on the right is the result of that. So you can see we can see the sort of fiber structure of the papyrus there. That's all great. Obviously, it's flattened and working correctly. But the ink is just not really part of this uh, signal. This is just another example of that same thing. This is something we call the carbon phantom that we made in the lab, and you'll see a lot more of that. But again, if we run this to the entire pipeline, what we get is sort of the virtually unrolled version. You know, if, you, if you roll this up, put it in a CT scanner, and then apply the whole pipeline, this is what you get. Um, and those dots are iron gall ink, so they actually show up. But these large characters are all written in carbon ink, and they're essentially invisible here. So how do we, well actually before we address that, this is a, a more simplified view of the same problem. This is like an idealized version of what we would call a subvolume, or just one really small region on a surface. So we can think of this as one really small region on a papyrus surface, which is fibrous, so it has these fibers running across it. So this is like one fiber running across, just to show that it's not a flat surface. And this is sort of what you can imagine happens when ink is written on the surface. So you see sort of two things. One is that there's an actual deposit on the surface with some thickness. Um, it's probably very small. It's not something you really think about most of the time when you're looking at ink on paper. But there is, if you zoom in all the way, actually a, a layer of material deposit in that sort of adds to the thickness of this layer. And additionally, the ink is liquid and soaks into the <coughs> So you have both of those. And if your ink has iron in it and you put it in x-ray, this is what it looks like. So the ink on the surface is super bright. And where it has soaked into the layer is also, you know, there's a detectable signal there. If the ink is carbon ink and it's on carbonized papyrus, this is what it would look like in x-ray, where essentially it looks almost invisible. And I say almost because it's important that we remember there actually was a change here. The thickness has changed and the texture has changed on the surface. But and that's actually still present in this image. It's just so hard to see that it, we don't normally detect that. So we made this thing called the Carbon Phantom, and I'll just skip ahead to this view to get familiar with it, because we're going to see a lot more images of this. Essentially, we 
Uh, this is papyrus. And like I said earlier, these dots and these sort of markers on the, the column headers and in the corners, that's all iron gall ink. And we use that later to register this, which I'll talk about. But these big characters are all written in carbon ink. And the columns are numbered one through six, and that corresponds to how many layers of carbon ink are, uh, excuse me, are applied. So this first column is just one layer of carbon ink, kind of like you'd expect in an actual manuscript. Normally there's no need to apply it multiple times. Since this is a lab example for us, what we're interested in is learning how we can detect the signal. So we want to start with something where we have a much stronger than normal signal to start to you know, test out some visual methods. So the second column has two layers of ink, so it's a thicker deposit, three layers all the way up to six. So by the time you get the sixth column, that's quite unrealistic. No real material would have six layers of ink, probably. But it lets us sort of test things out. So the key here is sort of combining multiple modalities. And this is just one example of how you can think about that. This is three images of the same thing, but we're looking at different representations. So the middle one is a photograph of this character. The left is what you get if you apply the whole pipeline, the sort of the texture image output is what we call it of virtual unwrapping. And on the right is what we might call an ink mask or a label that someone could make by loading this middle image in Photoshop and just manually identifying, okay, I'm gonna draw yellow where there's iron gall ink and I'm gonna draw green where there's carbon ink. So you can have all of these and they're all aligned with each other, which is helpful. So specifically in our process, the way that comes together is we start with this texture. So we made the carbon phantom, we rolled it up, put it in a micro CT scanner, ran the whole pipeline that the video talked about, and this is what we get. Um, although actually what's here is a little bit more than just an image. So as a result of the pipeline, there's a little additional information that turns out to be crucial here. So we can think of this not only as an output image, but we also, at any point on this image, we have a file that shows the three-dimensional position and surface normal within 3D space of the CT scan. So for any given one of these points, we can look here and read the value in this image and that'll tell us just the gray value of this image. But you can read the same pixel location over here and that'll give you three values that are XYZ in 3D space inside the three-dimensional CT scan and three more values that tell you which way you're oriented. So now we want to sort of stack more layers on here to make things useful for us. So we have this photograph that we took of the surface and um, it's not initially aligned, so actually I don't think I've mentioned this yet. This representation shows the columns separately, that's why we get some of these dots are doubled up. Because actually we process the columns individually, and then these images are all just six separate images sort of concatenated. So that's why we get this weird doubling effect. Um, of course, this reference photo doesn't have that, so we need to align it to what we're working on. So we run a process called registration which essentially now gives us this aligned version. So we just sort of cropped out each of the columns and aligned it exactly. And then actually we just throw away the original. And now what we're really interested in is this registered image. Um, of course, the reason we're able to do that is because we deliberately put these iron gold dots here. So we can align a dot on this with the dot that shows up here. Now we can take that image and just load that in Photoshop like I was talking about. And someone can manually just trace out where there's ink and where there's not ink. So now we have this big, beautiful sandwich with all this information aligned with each other. And then we proceed this way. So ultimately what we're gonna show here is that there's a signal actually present in the CT, but it's very faint. And that it's not something we can see with the naked eye, but a neural network's actually able to detect it. So this illustrates how we go through that process of training a network. So we have this sandwich we just made. And then actually for this process, we're ignoring the texture image and the reference photo. All I'm interested in right now are this file that for any position shows me where to go in the three-dimensional volume, and then this mask that tells me whether or not there's ink there. So these points are tied together because they're all aligned. So what we can do is we can sort of iterate across this 2D space of this image space, and at any given point, we can you know, read this file that tells us, okay, inside this scan, the three-dimensional scan, go to that position and get a subvolume which is like a little cube, and that's what it might look like. So that is gonna be our input ultimately to the neural network. And what we wanna do is have a network that tells us, based on that input alone, whether or not there's ink. Um, the only reason we need a neural network, obviously, is that it's not obvious just looking at it. You know, if this was 
iron gall ink, for example, you could probably just look at this as a human and it might be clear. But the whole point here is that I can't look at this and tell you if there's ink or not. I have no idea. So we're going to have a neural network do it for us. So, yeah, we get a label that goes with the input for training purposes. This is really easy because you just read the same pixel position in this label image and it just tells you, yeah, there's ink there. So now we have this pair of this three dimensional input, like it's a three dimensional image that we call a sub volume, and yes, it's ink. So then we feed those to three dimensional convolutional neural network. And we can sort of, we randomly iterate over the surface. Um, and actually, as I'll talk about, we define training regions and the prediction regions that we don't train on. But you can imagine we identify some region of this image as a training region, and then we randomly iterate over all the points in that image. And each time, we're getting the subvolume and the label. We're training the network. So this is what we're able to achieve with that. Um, this is actually the prior result, just to remind ourselves of like our previous state of the art, which pretty much doesn't show anything where the carbon ink is concerned. It, depending on the screen, sometimes shows up. I think you can kind of see it. In the sixth column, there's almost like ghosts of carbon characters there. So by the time you put on six applications, there's kind of a signal there. Um, but it's not really useful. And also, any columns that have a realistic amount of ink, there's no signal. But with this method, this is the result we can achieve. So the network's actually able to detect the presence of ink much better. And the way this is generated is you're actually looking at six different experiments. So each of these columns, this is a highly composite image. So each of these columns was done individually. And then additionally, each of the columns is actually five different networks that were trained. So we can imagine, let's just talk about the third column as an example. This is actually uh, five different trainings of a neural network just to generate this composite image. So first we take maybe that top character, we'd isolate that as our evaluation and prediction region. So we don't train on any points that come from that uh, delta character. And we train on these regions, the four below it. Um, and then we get a network, and then we give it all of the subvolumes that come from the region around that delta. And for each sort of pixel position, we just ask the network, do you think this is ink or not? If it says yes, we draw a white pixel. If it says no, we draw a black pixel. Do that for every pixel on this whole image, and this is what you get. So, what about this idea that you had uh, additional layers of ink? Uh, <coughs> yes. So, if you go, well, yeah. So, these columns are one through six, and the sixth column had six layers of ink, this one had one. So, yes, as you can so, see, yes. where there's one, it doesn't work. Is that where, exactly. where you go? Yes. So, uh, <coughs> I'll talk about why we think that is. Essentially what we want here is to show that, well, this is previous state of the art where nothing shows up at all. Now, if there's multiple applications, we can detect it. With this scan, we still can't detect the first column, but now we have some hypotheses around why and what we need to do to read it. So this is actually just another experiment that we did, which is the same method, but notice we've dropped out the ink label image. So the one that we made that made in Photoshop, we just discarded. We said, you know, actually, we don't even really need to bother. We could have it trained just on the original image. So this is the same process where we're training a network to take one of these subvolumes as input, but now the output is just the three-value RGB color in that image. Uh, it's kind of eliminating an unnecessary step. Um, so we just do the same process. We go through, for any given point, we know both what it looks like in three-dimensional CT and what color it should be. So we train the network to output what it thinks something would look like in visible color, based only on having seen its x-ray. And this is the output that that generates. So this is the same process as the last result image, where this is six columns are done separately, and each one is five different experiments, where one character is isolated and is not trained on, and then is predicted on, and that's repeated here like 30 times. Um, so we see the same thing in terms of where it works. Obviously, in the first column, it's able to learn the presence of iron gall ink but it never really learns the carbon ink, which we'll get to. But we think this is super cool because not only is it learning the presence of ink, it's learning more. In order to accurately output a color, it has to learn more properties of that subvolume. So one of those things, for example, is like the fiber structure. So if we look at the very top left, you can see the woven papyrus pattern. So this network, based only on seeing one little subregion of x-ray image, can tell you 
what that would look like if photographed, if it would be you know, light brown or dark brown. And when you apply that to every pixel, the resultant, I mean, you actually get the woven papyrus fiber structure present here, uh, which it, it learned basically, we didn't have to tell it that explicitly, it just sort of learned it by accident. And this is just a summary image showing photograph, our previous best, this new method, and then the sort of RGB method, side by side. So this is an example when applied to a real fragment. So this is a small fragment of a couple centimeters. And the reason this is possible, and we'll get into this in just a minute, but you'll see that this actually does show some promise. Um, and it has to do with the resolution. But essentially we do the same process here where I'm deliberately not yet showing a photograph of what text is supposed to be here to see if we can identify anything without knowing what's supposed to be there. But we do the same process, we train over there, and then we show a prediction over there, and then we uh, flip it and do the opposite. So this is, over the course of training, this is the outputs you get. Um, this is both sides. This alpha character over here is just for scale to show you what size you should be looking for. And then the question is, is there any text that we can see show up? Uh, like, are there any characters? So does anybody see any, does it look like there's any characters showing up? Yes, he was pointing to one. Well, it looks to me like there's one there. Maybe a W or Omega. Um, so, yeah, in fact, that is correct. It doesn't show super well on the screen, I guess. But there is an Omega there. So this is actually showing the correct text. And this is the first time we've really successfully done this with the real material. Um, on the right is sort of an idealized version of, as we improve this method, what we would hope to be able to produce for a scholar is an image that is enhanced. It shows something from x-ray, but then also you know, enhances where there's ink, so it's actually legible. So what is this uh, learning? So it's a neural network. The whole point is that we couldn't figure out the signal ourselves, so we just had a neural network do it. So what, it, what might it be picking up on? And this is sort of a discussion of that, our guesswork around that. So we think it has to do with what we call morphology, which is shape and texture rather than just intensity. So the carbon ink is, might look the same level of gray as where there's not ink. But where there's ink, the surface has a different texture, there's an additional thickness, and so on. And that's really subtle, but it's at least there. So the network can pick it up and we can't directly observe it. So this is sort of a, this is like a lab made example of just an index card and a bunch of carbon ink on it, just to, um, it's like overdone just to illustrate this point. You can see if you put a bunch of ink on this, there is a detectable presence. There's a big bump there. Um, and these two images are done in different energy levels of x-ray. That's why they have different sort of contrast. But either way, there's that bump. So if the bump is present, you should be able to pick it up. This is another view of the same thing. This is an SEM image we took here at UK, of scanning electron microscope of the surface. So you can see the bottom, this is a zoomed in really close on the boundary between ink and not ink. So the top is just blank papyrus, there's no ink, and the bottom is where there is ink. And you can see there's a textural difference. You get this wavy sort of stipple pattern where there's blank papyrus, but the ink is a lot smoother and it has cracks in it and so on. And this is another view, which is just a cross section where you cut into the surface, and it actually shows the measured thickness of the carbon ink layer. Of, and in this case, it's not multiple layers like on the carbon ink phantom. This is just one layer of carbon ink that we drew and took to the lab. And they can cut into it and actually measure that it's about you know, four to five microns thick. So what this would say is that if there's some textural thing you're looking for or you're trying to look for some thickness pattern that's four or five microns thick, you really need to be imaging this at a resolution in that ballpark. If you're not imaging it close to four or five microns voxel resolution in the CT scan, you couldn't hope to pick up on a signal that's smaller than your pixel size, essentially. And so the reason the first column doesn't work in the carbon phantom is that it's imaged at 12 microns, and we would anticipate that the ink level there is only five or six microns thick anyways. So by the time you're at the first column, you're looking for a signal that's smaller than a pixel. So there's nothing really there to detect. This is just another illustration, but more zoomed in version of the textural difference. So when you're able to get this high resolution, obviously there's a difference. In Discern. Uh, the problem is is a resolution one. So here is the same thing at pretty high resolution, and this is we're just sort of synthetically blurring this so I can illustrate that 
as you get blurrier and blurrier to the point where this resembles the resolution that's achievable with CT, which is much lower than the scanning of the so At this point, what was an easy discernible difference is now pretty hard to tell. Um, so if you look at this, it might be a lot harder to tell, whereas here in that circle, you can kind of see the boundary a little bit. So fortunately, the resolution is getting better. These are some images from 2009. And then this is the same scroll image uh, last year. So I'm just going to go real quickly through progressively zooming in on this. This is a region of this scroll in 2009, and this is image last year at a different facility. And so you can see the resolution capabilities are improving. So this is sort of a side by side. This is what we have now compared to 10 years ago. That's dramatically better and is approaching now, finally. Um, the threshold we think we need, which is to image these at four or five micron resolution. Right now, we're still at eight or nine. And so, we're kind of trying to anticipate with our methods the physics side of things, which is not really our domain. But as that stuff improves, we want to have methods that we can take advantage of ultra high resolution stuff as it comes online. So, let me just skip that. And there's some acknowledgments. We have a lot of people on our team. Um, and imaging this stuff takes a lot of collaboration since it's not our material and there's a lot of conservators and so on involved. We also don't own most of these scanning facilities or anything. So we have a lot of collaborators. I did want to mention that we make heavy use of UK's Center for Computational Sciences. We use that for all of our machine learning training. Um, we decided to do that instead of going with a big cloud provider or something or GPUs, etc. We would be very happy with that. And yeah, Dr. Seals is the PI. We have graduate students and staff members on the team. And then we also I wanted to mention the undergraduate team, a lot of them are present. And if you are an undergraduate and you'd be interested in working with us, Christy Chapman is on our team, we should talk to her. If you need her contact information, ask her or me. What's up? drawers like this with fragments that have visible text. So what we want to do, um, and of course in the examples I was showing, I was primarily showing examples where we both trained and predicted on the same scan of the same thing, which is not what you want to do in real life. We want something where we can scan a scroll that we haven't read any of and then read the whole thing, which is very different. So what we want to do with the reference library is, you know, there are hundreds to thousands of these fragments with visible text. So we want to scan a bunch of them and train one model over all of them. So then it learns to be able to handle differences in you know, different fragments, or you know, each time you do a CT scan, there's a ton of physics and stuff behind the scenes that makes just the distribution of the images different and so on. So we want to train one model over a bunch of them instead of just over one, so that it's more robust to that, and then hopefully that can learn to handle other as well as the scene that gets up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, last question. Um, yes, and we have done many parts of that. So, and, and part of this is we, like this live example of carbon phantom, we didn't carbonize. We have for fun carbonized some of our own samples and then scanned them. Um, you would expect that that would improve things, but ultimately we would still want to move towards something where we're really kind of at scale training something across many different real samples. If that makes sense. I, I think if we 
made our own scroll, carbonized it, and trained on that, it would do better than one that we didn't carbonize in terms of predicting on a real sample, but not as good as if you trained over a bunch of real samples. Let me point out that proper carbonization requires a volcano. You can get pretty close with like a kiln or a campfire. Well, thank you very much. Thanks.